Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of MECFS Alert. Today, we go to Boston, where I'm so honored and so delighted to have Rosa Parinana uh, to talk to us about her work on ME and her work with David Sistrom, who was an earlier interview on this program and one of the most successful, in fact, the most successful in terms of YouTube clicks way over 27,000. Welcome to the broadcast. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Llewellyn. It's really an honor for me to be here uh, as a guest of you. I've seen like all the amazing uh, physicians and researchers that you interview, and it's really an honor for me. Um, so yeah, I am a um, Peruvian physician. I was trained in Peru as a general practitioner. Then after finishing medical school, I served for a year in the rural uh, highlands of Peru. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, and then I studied in a little bit of ultrasound and then I also worked with patients um, on the inpatient hospitalized patients, sometimes seeing outpatients as well. And about a year and a half, I got this amazing opportunity to come to the States and work as a research fellow at Regan Women's Hospital and, and as a mentee of Dr. David Sistrom. And it's been really an amazing opportunity for me. In fact, he's been like one of the best mentors I could ever wish for. Like he opened a lot of opportunities for me. And I guess we'll discuss more about that. Absolutely. Now you're a full medical doctor, uh, yep. but you are working as a researcher. Uh, and Sistrum, of course, is very interested in the impact of exercise and post-exercise malaise, as it's called. Uh, was this a field that you were interested in before you came to work for Dr. Sistrom? Um, not really. Actually, uh, I was mm, more interested in general in internal medicine. But when I found out that my future mentor was uh, a lot um, involved in this disease, actually, it was quite surprising for me because I have never heard of it. And even uh, in my medical training, even though uh, I, I was trained in this, uh, one of the oldest medical schools in, in, the, in all America, St. Marcus University, it's really well known in my country. And we had a really very, a very detailed education, but despite that, I've never heard about MECFS and I was uh, quite shocked to see how the amount of people that it affects, uh, not only in the US, but all, in all, all over the world, and just seeing that there's not that there were not enough uh, research about it was really shocking. But I, I think that at the same time it meant that it was a huge opportunity for researchers to do and to find out more about this. Um, how how do you find ME as a subject? Uh, I mean, this is very far from practicing medicine in rural Peru. And I want to say parenthetically, if I could that I'm sure the community will be delighted to see some young person like yourself taking an interest in this disease. One of the concerns has been that uh, researchers and clinicians in the field tend to be getting older. So in that, welcome and tell us about how, how ME came to you when you got to Boston and uh, Brigham and Women's. Yeah, initially I was working on this um, big database that we have and, and about patients that, well, we have um, samples, plasma samples, and also data of patients who undergo an invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test. So I was working on analyzing inflammatory um, um, markers and the results of uh, something that had already been uh, evaluated by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and I didn't really kind of knew a lot about MCFS until we started uh, actually in January on 2020, uh, a clinical trial. And then um, one of the research assistant that came uh, to work with me, she's from Boston and actually she shared with me her story about being uh, actually suffering from MCFS and recovering. And it was really, uh, I think it, it touched me, it touched me uh, just hearing her story and how devastated it was for her and then I just started seeing a lot of these 
um, patients also who would come for uh, to us to participate in a clinical trial. And all of them uh, had, you know, shared this similar story about being uh, very active before and, and young, many of them were young female. Like I could also identify myself and they had to stop sometimes working or studying and, and just being bedridden, bedridden. So that was really uh, shocking to me. And, and I think that made me have a lot of passion of the work and the work that I was doing and actually uh, being very involved into MTFS and trying to- Tell me, tell, Rosa, tell me about your day-to-day -day work. Is it in a lab? Is it uh, with- with uh, sufferers, is it uh, is it paper research? Is it practical research? Are you working with bodily fluids and that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. I think it, it's a little bit of everything. Every day is just different, and it depends on what um, what of the project we're working. Um, and currently, we are working on several projects, and I like to divide them into some retrospective studies in which we assess the data of this invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test. But we also have clinical trials going on. We, we just finished that clinical trial that I mentioned uh, in which we were using mestinone uh, in MCFS patients. But we're also um, setting up another clinical trial that will come uh, likely on, on the summer, uh, maybe before. And then uh, working on this grant applications that we had. So depending on what, I think it's what, what I do. But before, when we had a clinical trial, for instance, um, I would come to the lab and then I just consent the patients um, who were scheduled for that day and then um, and walking them through uh, into the exercise lab and then uh, just taking some measurements and some values of them and, and then just uh, seeing after them, after they had the invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test, running the blood samples uh, to get the, sam the plasma stored and then just um, finish, wrapping up all the, the encounter with the patient. Sometimes in the afternoons, I'll have to also um, call the patient, do a follow-up to see how they were doing after they their test, whether they were experiencing any issues from the medication or not, and things like that. Uh, and sometimes uh, I also work um, um, doing, I think, um, maybe the, the, the paperwork, if we want to call it that way, I've been doing um, protocols, assembling the consent forms, just writing up the papers. Right now, I'm actually, we're working on um, the results of this um, clinical trial that we have and analyzing all the data, basically statistics. <laughs> That's what we're doing right now. Rosa, tell me a little bit more about the clinical trials. Normally when we here of clin clinical trials, we think there is there is a medicine a compound, and you want to see how effective it is. What are your clinical trials? What do they involve? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the clinical trial um, that we just finished, uh, this one, it's um, double-blinded placebo-controlled clinical trial. It, it means that um, we have two groups, one that received the medication, pyridoxine or mestinone, and the other one who received a medication, a pill that looks the same, but it that it hasn't, doesn't have any compound. It's a placebo, it. right. Yeah, and it's double-blinded because mm, the patients don't know which uh, medication they are receiving, and nor does the physicians or the investigators. We don't know until the end of the trial. And in this case, we um, uh, have the patients having an initial test, an invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test, in which they have these two catheters and, uh, placed in line, uh, one of the, in the wrist and the other one on the neck. And then they exercise on, on, on this um, um, cycle ergometer and we analyze the breathing patterns, uh, some uh, blood and gases um, as well. And then we also analyze the pressures inside the heart. And we have the patients doing that test. And after finishing that, and we'll, we will give them the medication or the placebo and have them wait 50 minutes. And after that, we'll have the patients having another, repeating the same exercise basically, and just taking the same measurements. And so that at the end, we can compare how um, the improvement or worsening, what, whatever change we can see uh, in these parameters on these patients. Rosa, can you say the name of the drug again? I didn't quite get it. Uh, pyridostigmine. 
uh, it's called mestinon as well. It's and um, what's it what's it supposed to do for an ME patient? Yeah, uh, we believe that um, it it increases the concentration of a neurotransmitter, a chem chemical compound, which is called um, acetylcholine, on the nerves. Uh, and this increases the you know, constriction of the constriction of the vessels on the lower uh, veins on the lower legs, and then it increases the return to the blood of the blood to the heart. That's what we think. That's the, the way that we think it works. And the results have been fairly promising, have they? They are promising, <laughs> indeed. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I can you know um, this this way a lot of the results, but uh, you surely be will see that in the coming months. And uh, how is your personal reaction as a physician being to this terrible disease where people never get better or most patients never get better? They get up and down and up and down. But it is for most of those who are reflected a life sentence. Um, how is your own reaction as a physician being? Uh, I mean, physicians like to make people better as both the people, the patients feel better, and so does the physician. Yeah, for sure. I think that it is um, a condition that first is not well recognized uh, by physicians. It's because we don't get that in our training. It, they usually, I don't think they, they teach us. I think that they don't even teach it here in the States. Uh, and the second, once you have that patient, I think the frustration of First, not having what your patient has because you don't you don't know that this is, this is there for you don't recognize it and you spend a lot of tests and everything comes back uh, negative like every, the patient appears to be normal but you are seeing the patient and the patient is suffering the patient is having a true illness and then once you recognize what disease the patient has then it comes the frustration of not having uh, maybe what medication to give them. And if you actually come with one medication or one, or one treatment what approach, then just seeing sometimes how your patient uh, gets better, but then as you were saying, gets back, like uh, has this post exceptional malaise, this up on um, and wanes and, and, and their disease scores. And that's, I think that's frustrating. Actually seeing some patients, I think there are many of them who unfortunately takes uh, their lives away uh, because they feel so frustrated and they feel that they're not understand that that's really devastating for me to know that there, there, there is a lot of suicide exactly exactly and that's really devastating and this i i think that breaks my heart to to believe that we're not doing the things that we need to as doctors to help them and at least we should show some fashion if we are on the pathway to finding out what they have and what treatment to give them. At least we can show them passion and understanding of their medication. I think that's something that- A couple of years ago, I tried to lock into, with the help from Linda Tannenbaum and the Open Medicine Foundation, into MECFS in minority communities. We did some, we did a broadcast with an African-American broadcaster. And, uh, and we, it was shocking to find out that very few African-Americans and other minorities uh, knew what the disease was or what they were suffering from. Um, have you encountered that? Have you encountered in the communities in Boston, ignorance so complete that people who are sick with ME do not know or even know that they might be sick? Yeah, well, I, I haven't had the chance to see those kind of patients but I think that that might be very true. Actually, the, the patients that we see for the most part are white patients. We don't see many African-American or uh, Latin American patients. Uh, and I actually didn't know why, probably it's what you're saying. In fact, the, the medical, I think knowledge about it, it's, it's quite less and therefore there might be bedridden, but just not knowing what they're having, what they have and not really seeking attention. When your research project is over, whether it's months or years or decades, uh, what do you plan to do? To practice medicine in this area or something else or to continue as a researcher? Uh, yeah, I actually am um, applying for 
um, internal medicine residency. I plan to become an internist and then um, getting more in training as to and, and become eventually a clinician researcher, something it's very similar to what Dr. David Sistrom does. I've seen that that's also very helpful because you have access to the patients and you can offer them and more than the treatments, you can also offer them some uh, experimental medications or I think that's very important. Finally, as a young person, a young doctor, looking at myalgic encephalomyelitis, which you had not encountered before you came to the US, uh, are you optimistic with what you've seen with the research you've done? Are you optimistic that there's hope on the horizon? Yeah, for sure. I am very optimistic. Now, seeing that um, the Department of Defense, uh, as after about 10 years, giving more funding to this and, and just hearing about the maybe the NIH as well, getting more attention, at, I think, in a way, what is happening with the patients uh, who are long haulers of COVID, it's it's definitely a disgrace, but it's also an opportunity because it's giving it's given more um, uh, funding for overall. I think something that the condition that it's very similar, and actually uh, we believe that it might be basically sisters or maybe the same disease. So it's going to get more attention for MECFS. So I'm I'm really optimistic about the fact that more funding is coming, more researchers are going to start um, uh, getting more interested into MECFS and eventually I think that we will find um, some good treatments for the patients. Um, how many researchers are they working with Dr. David Sistrom? Uh, we're quite a, a, well, researchers, researchers, I would say small <laughs> uh, group, only three. Um, I'm working with two um, uh, research assistants, uh, one is from the UK and the other one is from Boston. Bo both of them are really incredible and are helping a lot. But we also work with uh, some other clinicians who also help with the clinical trials and um, in collecting data. And that involves the exercise physiologist, uh, some physician assistants. Also, we, we collaborate with other doctors as well, uh, such as Dr. Aaron Waxman. So we really have a whole group um, that it's also dedicated to that. Well, I think you're very lucky to work with Dr. Sistrom, but I also think the community, the community of people who suffer from ME is very lucky to have you. It's been a pleasure to have you on the broadcast and thank you so much, Rosa. Good luck. I hope you'll come back and report to us maybe in a few months how it is going. Uh, and I'm so encouraged by your hopefulness. Take care of yourself. All the very best. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.